from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello and welcome to the Wow Report on Radio Andy, where we count down the top 10 things that made us go wow. And I'm Fenner Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder, joined uh, this week with the lovely James St. James. Woo, uh, that's me! Editor of the Wow Report. And standing in for the legendary Tom Campbell, the incredible Jeffrey Bowyer Chapman. Hi, thanks for having me back. What shall I say about you? You're an actor, you're a writer, <laughs> you're also <laughs> one of the judges of Canada's Drag Race, which is just I rap. I am. No, so I well, am, and, now that, and, and thank you so much. Now that I'm seeing y'all snatching up more and more Emmys, once again, RuPaul's just, Drag Race is just cleaning it up. I'm hoping that Canada's Drag Race can get in there next year. We'll get to that. Yeah. We'll be up for a All Juno right. Award. Isn't that what they, their televisions? Yes, yeah, yeah, the Juno. It's like the Canadian Grammys. There you Who go. Knows? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's leap right in at number 10. Number 10. Something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time, and Jeffrey, I know you are burning to talk about this. Yes. The Vow. T t number 10, The Vow. Just take it away. Oh my gosh, I am so obsessed with this series. So it is a, I believe it's a six part docu-series on HBO Max, the first nine. four episodes of, oh, it's nine? Nine hours. Oh, ooh, chow, we got a whole bunch more story to get into then because the first four episodes have aired and I am hooked. It is about a company, and I use the word loosely with sarcastic quotation marks, named Nexium. And within that company, there's many different tiers and levels and programs. And the main program is called ESP or Human Potential. And essentially, uh, it was it was founded by a man named Keith Rainier, who's a brilliant genius on paper. And the entire premise of it is that it's a it's about ethics. It's about human potential and uh, going past all of your fears and self imposed blocks and becoming the best version of you that you can become. No, wait, hold on, but it's actually a sex cult, isn't doesn't that it? it? But, but doesn't it sound great when you when you lay it out like I well, just so does Nazism when you, if you, if you lay it out right. I mean, so does you know, Satanism. It's, in, um, it's insane. So with, within within this organization that turns out yes to be a cult, there's a, there's a different there's a separate secret society made strictly of women, and they have a whole system called DOS, which is dominant over submissive, and they have a whole master slave type deal set up. So it's all women in 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 dominant master roles, and under each of those women, they each have ten slaves, and they brand their slaves, and they and they have to have. This is the one that Allison Mack from Smallville. She was Chloe on Smallville, and she's the one who is in charge of it all, and she's like the whip mistress, the dominatrix of in charge of everything, right? Correct. And the reason why it speaks so, you know, so dearly to my heart is because I was actually invited into Nexium. They have no! different branches. Yes, not into DOS, obviously, because I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't fit the the, the bill. Um, but uh, they have different branches in New York and Vancouver. And I lived in Vancouver for many years working on different shows. And I knew some of the members of Nexium, Allison Mack and Kristen Crook. Wait, you know I, Allison? Uh huh. You know Tom Welling? Sure uh, I've met Tom, yes. But, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But Ali and I have spent quite some time together. No! I had no idea. Yeah, I had no idea that all of this was going on. You know, it was one of those programs where so many Vancouver actors were involved in this program. And it sounds great. It sounds like, you know, like your life is a mess. You have no idea what you're doing in your 20s. Come it into this program. Like and we will. is what it sounds like. It does. But the thing about cults, James, St. James, is that for the most part, so much of what they have to offer you, it sounds practical and it sounds like very yeah. applicable, right? It's, like it's, you know what it is, so being, uh, being lost in your 20s, I came to New York in my 20s, I did something called Est. Um, the yeah, yes, the one where you pee your pants. Hard, the thing where you weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. I'm, I'm disappointed to report there was no sex culty bits. <laughs> um, or, or was there? <laughs> I just missed <laughs> out. But, it, but, but Jeffrey, yes. Lots of practical life hacks. I mean, mm. it's it, the way it starts out the first episode, it's all this philosophy and what's in your way and attachment and upsets and all that kind of just do it philosophy that was so central to the 80s and 90s uh, of self-improvement. It's, it's, it's like, what can be wrong with this? 
Absolutely, absolutely. And when you have all of your friends jumping on board, it just seems like the thing to do. But it is a tiered system where you have to pay thousands upon thousands of dollars for each new step to, you know, to progress further and further and further. It was something that was that seemed very obviously culty to me at that age, although I could see people, you know, improving certain aspects and areas of their life. It was something that also something just seemed off about it. So it's nothing that I ever engaged in personally, but I know a ton of people who have. And you know, the thing about cults is that they, you know, it's like the telltale signs is when they want to, they try to break you down and rebuild you in their image. I feel like that's, it's something that occurs all over the place. There's cult, if you open your eyes and look around, there's cults all over Los Angeles, acting classes and, you know, philosophy classes and things like that. It's, it's and a bizarre Buddhism world. And Scientologists and Absolutely. Uh, the cult I of um, uh, drag race. I would put yes. that in there. <laughs> and, 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 uh, Trump. Christianity. I mean, because one of yes. the keys of cults is that you need to evangelize, you need to proselytize, you need to get more paying people in. It's a multi-level, it's like a Tupperware party. It's, on but it's like World of Wonder as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, to, so to wrap it up, it's a, a nine episode series. Four episodes are uh, have aired so far. It's brilliant. Uh, it stars Sarah Edmondson, an actress who was a part of the cult and in the DOS slave master system. And it's an expose. She completely lays it all out, her experience, the good, the bad, the ugly. And it's the story of her trying to take this system down. It's fascinating. Highly recommended. HBO Max. Yes, and they release a new episode every week on Sunday evenings. James, I dare you to top that with number nine. Number nine. <laughs> well, yeah, taught me, James. To taught me. Talk, <laughs> I wanted to talk about the biggest story of the week. Obviously, uh, Chris Evans and his accidental peen pick, <laughs> the dick pick that was uh, released. He was with some friends and they were doing an Instagram story. And um, a as the story ended, his picture, his uh, the grid popped up from his pictures, and on it was an erect penis that was his. And he saw his face, immediately realized what he had done, and he took it down. But of course, it was the internet, and a million pictures <clears throat> in ten minutes. It was went around the world a hundred times. Everybody was commenting on it, and the fallout from it is sort of what I want to talk about because it's so interesting that Chris Evans is so beloved by the industry, by the media, by his peers, and by his fans, that the fans immediately came to his defense and said, look, he suffers from anxiety. This is something that deeply embarrasses him, and we're going to do what we can to scrub Twitter of this image. And so they took down as many as they could. It became very hard to find within a matter of a couple hours. And they started flooding the market, flooding Twitter with images of him with a puppy. And so when you do put Chris Evans in, all you get now are pictures of him with a puppy. And it becomes harder and harder to find. And it's one of those things where five years ago, that would not have been the case. And five years ago... It would not have been it would have been like a scandal for a man to have his penis, you know, a, a peen picture out there. And it, I was thinking it wasn't until Justin Bieber did it. Remember Orlando Bloom, the same. Orlando way Bloom. Yes. And then if you recall, we did an episode on Teen Wolf where one of the boys picture was was leaked. And so the entire cast immediately put masturbating videos up in solidarity. And so all the hot guys on Teen Wolf made norm help normalize no they didn't videos on on twitter and um i think chris handled it very well he um after a beat where he realized not a beat but after <laughs> after a moment he realized he, he came realized to his this. senses <laughs> and he he said he tweeted now that i have your attention and then he said vote november 3rd and so he tried to, you know, turn it around and he went on Tamron Hall and Good Morning America and did the same thing. And I just think it's sort of an interesting, I just think it's fascinating that, you know, in the past, it ruined, it ruined careers. And you think of like Sylvester Stallone, pre-Rocky, when he did The Italian Stallion, he had a porn and he almost didn't ever got Rocky because of it. It was good. You know, it was going to take him down. You had like Jan Michael Vincent and Sam Jones, Flash Gordon, remember it? And that almost did, they weren't going to release Flash Gordon because of it. Um, I mean, like it was something that was very scandalous. And nowadays it's just not scandalous at all because everyone has naked pictures of themselves on their um, phone. And I imagine the three of us here, the four of us here, 
probably have stories as well. Well, even more, um, <laughs> I, I think it's awesome that um, men are finally, we're well, finally that, getting- you know, like when you talk about like what happened to Jennifer Lawrence and things like that, and it was a, a very yeah. negative experience for her. But and but nowadays it's like it's it's everybody has it, and it's not a big but, deal for anybody. But not even that. Like in films, like you get to see boobs all the time and stuff. You never see men naked. No, actually, um, uh, the my boys in the first episode of the boys. It's, well, um, until recently, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is, how are we so sure that it was actually Chris Chris's penis? Like because, if it's just well, as all, it, was, it was the look on his face when he saw what it was happening, and then immediately he took it down and uh, sort of acknowledged what was happening. And okay, the way James, you say, Chris, you know, like Chris has handled this well, like your friends, like because you've seen the penis. Well, I, I'm you know, very now, intimate with him now. Let's just say <laughs> I know all about Chris Evans. <laughs> We're speechless. Well, lucky him that he has such that he has such a has such a supportive fan base that they would do, is, the, no, do the due it's diligence of scrubbing it's, Twitter. It's, yes, it's, it is. It's, I, yeah. I need to tap into that fan base. <laughs> well, have it isn't his brother gay, and we've seen his being picked before. Oh, we've seen his being picked many times. Yes, his brother. Who, we, we've we've gone up his butthole. We've we've been a lot of times with, with the other Evans boy. Who he was Chris was, Evans' brother? He was on One Life to Live. He was the first gay sex scene on soap operas. Luke Evans? 2016, 2017, like that. What's his name? Is it Luke Evans? No, that's someone else. Hmm. There's too many There's too many blandly handsome white boys yeah. named Chris in Hollywood. There's just well, not yeah, a dime a dozen. I mean, they're, they're the, the, the hot Chris's. There's Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans, Chris, um, uh, what's the other one? Fine. Chris Pine from Wonder Woman, and mm-hmm. then there's one of the old Chris Pratt that we hate now. So I mean, why? I'm sorry. Why do we hate him now? He's all evangelical and anti-gay and weird and Christian and. and Ooh, I didn't know that. That's a shame. Yeah. His yeah. brother's name is Scott Evans. Scott Evans, yes. Well, well, now that Chris Pratt is out, that leaves room for one more blandly handsome white dude named Chris to come in and take his place. There we go. <laughs> we need we need five Denzels. We need five Denzels in Hollywood. Well, right? I, I'm, I'm nominating Chris Messina because I love him, boy. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, you know, we'll post a picture on the WOW report, but I guess we won't. <laughs> yeah, we'll post a picture of Chris with it with a puppy. With a puppy. All right. Okay. The puppy episode. Right. Moving on. Number eight. Number eight. Um, I was going to talk about Cuties. Have you heard about this film? Um, Netflix original. It's about a group of 11 year old French girls and they're sort of taking these risque moves from music videos. And of course, the right wing with their obsession with pedophiles are up in arms about it, saying it's pro pedophilia and child pornography, none of which it is. It's really much more a critique of, you know, the sexualization, speaking of James, the sexualization of society. I was going to talk about that. And maybe there is a time to talk about that. But kind of like, where does this come from? This sort of sexualization, this infantilization and right on time. On my Instagram live stream feed, up pops that evening, Madonna um, announcing that she is writing the screenplay of her life and directing it. And she's doing a live stream with Diablo Cody, who wrote Juno. And it is the most extraordinary hour of performative nonsense self-involved narcissism you will ever see in your life. And it just goes to show how much people still care about Madonna because, you know, I'm out there posting about Trump every day on Facebook and I get a few comments. Oh my God, I just said a couple of things and you think I'd like set fire to the fucking Vatican. You seem to be the only one that's obsessed with Madonna. You and Matthew Redman are the only people on the planet who still talk about her with any regularity. Matthew came for me and said, how dare you? I know you've always hated her. And I have always hated her. I have, a, I have a love-hate relationship with her. But this is, you've got to watch this video. We will post the link to it. She is so mean. To yeah. Diablo Cody. All yeah. the way through. And Diablo's like, not quite knowing how to go along with it. It is awkwardness personified. 
Michelle but Diablo Brown. realizes that there's a there's a giant paycheck involved here, and that's I have a feeling they're going to try and break it into a nine part uh, HBO Max <laughs> series so that you have the the nineteen eighty four days, you have the Evita days, you have the the sex tape. I would kind of I think I would be into that. Well, well yeah, that was the fascinating. Yeah. That was the fascinating part because through the course of the live stream, they were actually physically writing the script and talking about all of the different chapters that they'll be hitting in the biopic. Yes, but like not really writing anything. You know, <laughs> grabbing the computer and saying, "I like to be in the driver's seat," and then wanted to know how you spell sensitive and said, yeah. "Trilogy." I know it's three films, right? I mean, she is so brittle and defensive that she can only breathe by putting people down. And that's why I thought, yeah. you know, like Trump, so completely self-involved, the only way she can exist is to negate whoever's around her and critique other. Michelle Visage was in the room commenting. And at one point Madonna notices Michelle getting all these comments and it's like, who's Michelle Visage? It's not fair she's getting more comments than I am. <laughs> that's now, incredible. You know, I, I, I stand by the fact I've always believed that the people who become the biggest legends on the planets are the biggest narcissists. And there's something about like the idea of Elizabeth Taylor. It sounds like it'd be fun to hang out with her, but she's probably a screeching, self-involved, <laughs> nasty bit of, of work. And James, yeah. James, you what? didn't hear, you didn't hear what Elizabeth Taylor died. <laughs> but like a J Lo, and right. I think, I think and you have to have a little bit. I think you have to have, to have a little bit of a screw loose to want to have that level of fame. But Joan yeah. Collins, I did work with on American Horror Story, and she was just so lovely and divine. Well, I, 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 will I, will, I was just trying to think of yeah. somebody who has is, is reached that level of of fame. I, I will say whatever whatever Madonna's doing whatever Madonna's doing with her skin, like let me know because damn that bitch looked good. She looked good, honey. At one point, yeah. someone asked them one of the questions. So they're pretending to write a scene. And the scene in the movie they're pretending to write is when Madonna meets up with her sister. So it just speaks to my point that in Madonna's world, there are only iterations of Madonna. And she says to her sister, hi, how are you doing? And Madonna's like, mm, no, I would never say anything like, hi, how are you doing? I'd say something far more interesting than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just well, Oh. Also, though, to to her to her credit, how would you write your own? I mean, when you write your own story, don't you give yourself the best lines and get and, and make yourself be the most fabulous person in, in any no, way? I gave them all to you, James. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I've been guilty of that on occasion. <laughs> right, and then I love a question came up like, "What did she think of Pose?" And she was like, "It's hard for me to like something I lived." Yeah. <laughs> No, but I say that too. I can't watch Pose. I was there. I, I don't. I, I, I'm too. But Madonna crazy. really wasn't there. What? Right. Exactly. She, she didn't live it. She just stole she, it. For right. I was. I was. I was. I was. I was okay with the level of shade she was serving until she came for Sarah Jessica Parker and her shoe. Her shoe design collection, and that's when it. That's when I was just. <laughs> that was the breaking point. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Her shoes got attacked again and again and again and. And yeah. I like Sarah's shoes. I like Katy Perry's shoe line. And well, just Dia Vincent. Diablo Cody was wearing the shoes at the time, so it was just another reason for Madonna oh, to get in there. And, okay, you know. okay. <laughs> and while this was happening, they're in LA, by the way. And 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 at one point, Diablo says, "You know, LA is on fire." By the way, and it's just so a perfect picture of hell. Yeah, we're in the fires of hell, and over there in the corner will be Madonna writing her screenplay about her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't wait for the movie. That's all I gotta say. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah. Well, the Facebook Live was good enough for me. Thank you for sending that to me, Fenton. It made my day. Thank you for watching. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know, the, game, like, the person who should play young Madonna in the 80s would be Paris Jackson. And how brilliant would that be? How fabulous. Yes. Be awesome. I, 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 my one regret is that she, Madonna, is not gonna play Madonna. Because I think it should be written by Madonna, directed by Madonna, and starring Madonna as Madonna. Well, yeah. and then you, start, you get the Betty Davis thing where she's like 70 years old playing a teenager and right. like, you're talking like this. And she's like, I, yeah, yeah. that would be I, that would be fabulous. I, I, I think that whatever happened to baby Jane, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I personally think that Paris Jackson should, should hold off until the Michelle Visage biopic. Ah, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> also, I, if, if you you might you probably remember there was a very, very famous MTV ad that David LaChapelle did, and it was old Madonna and old Courtney Love doing whatever happened to Baby Jane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you remember that? Did you ever mm-hmm. see that? Yes. Shut up. I we think I just saw it recently. I'll post it. Okay. All right. Wow well, presents plus show. God shave the queens now streaming. Um, follow the Queens of RuPaul's Drag Race UK on their official Drag Race UK tour six days after the finale ad. That's at wowpresentsplus.com. Um, Blake, have you got a question before we go to break? I do. It's about the Emmys. Um, the first Emmys were in 1949, right down the street from WOW headquarters at the Hollywood Athletic Club. How many categories were at the first Emmys in 1949? And how many categories are there this year? Oh, you're listening to Wow Report on Radio Andy. We'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back. I'm Fenton Bailey here with Jeffrey Bowyer Chapman, our special guest standing in for Tom Campbell. Hi. The irrepressible James St. James. And Blake with our answer to the question before the break. Yeah, I asked. The first Emmy Awards were held in 1949. How many no, How many awards were handed out that night? And how many awards will be handed out in 2020? Well, I'm going to say there was probably Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Comic, Best TV Show, and like Best Director. There was probably like four or five. I'll say six. My okay. guess was 12. Okay. There were six at the first one. Oh, well, um, there you go. How many are there now? Six, six, six. <laughs> 47. 123. You're close, 120. Wow. <laughs> and that leads right into my number seven. Number seven. I was going to talk about how World of Wonder has won four of those Emmys. So far, yes, this week, yeah. So far, Just we've this won. Week. Yeah, I wanted to name all the people. We got Outstanding Picture Editing, Jamie Martin, Michael Rojal, Paul Cross, Michael Lynn Days, and Ryan Malik. For Outstanding Hair, we have Curtis Foreman and Ryan Randall. Love Curtis, yes, and love Ryan. Yeah, you can check him out on uh, Transformations with James St. James. Yes, we did. did Very, very, years and years ago, we did a transformation with Curtis, and he was so funny. And I think that's what Joel and uh, Rue maybe saw. Maybe. You did a couple with them, I think. Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. Um, also, outstanding contemporary makeup. We have Natasha Marcelina, David Protrusion, a.k.a. Raven, Jen uh-huh. Rosa, and Nicole. Yeah. Jen yes, Rosa Jen. Is, is, my, is my sister. I love Jen so I more than life itself. Her I love Jen, too. Amazing family on the planet. Really good, good people. She's incredible. She always she always beats your face, and she has this like incredible airbrush that she uses on my face when she does my mug yes. as well. She's she's extraordinary. Yes, and then so the fourth one. Yes, the fourth one we've won so far is outstanding casting for a reality program with Goloka Balti and Ethan Peterson. I don't know either of them. Congratulations! They're amazing too. We've done many, many shows with them casting. I should get a visual aid. Why didn't I think of this? Yeah, gra- gra- grab one of your Emmys, Fenton. Please. Okay, so watching on YouTube. Yay! Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Tomorrow, tomorrow we're gonna find out if Rue wins for outstanding host. That's Saturday night. That would be setting a record if he wins. Right. And also, wins. we'll find out if Untucked won for outstanding reality program and then Wait. sunday night at the main primetime emmys we'll find out if we won outstanding competition program again what is is he tied with carol burnett or ellen degeneres or or mark Bur- you know or uh, probably jeff probst jeff probst probably okay yeah so i didn't know before this that um the emmys were kind of like coachella Four nights over two weekends. Did, is that new? They're usually. I think they're just usually two, uh, one night over the two weekends. Isn't it like two nights over the course of two weekends? I don't think it's yeah, normally it's, four. It, yeah. This weekend is what Tom likes to call the schmimmies. Not because yeah. they're not as important, but just because there's not as much fanfare behind it. But mm-hmm. 
Um, I tell you, there's Emmys everywhere. Then there's the international news Emmys and the, the, the you know. Daytime Emmys, the local news Emmys. Mm -hmm. So tune in on Sunday to see if we take home the big prize. Thank you. All right, let's move on to number six. <laughs> number six. Number six. Um, on Netflix, I watched uh, The Babysitter, Killer Queens, which is the sequel to the 2017 uh, movie, uh, The Babysitter. And I don't know if we talked about it then. It's probably the best movie Netflix has ever done. It's a slasher film by McG, who is the guy who did Charlie's Angels and a bunch of movie, you know, uh, music videos and things. Um, it is about the, the babysitter was this young kid and he has a crush on his babysitter and she um, she's babysitting. And one night she brings her boyfriend over and he sneaks out of bed and he's watching them to see what, what they're doing. And it turns out that she's part of a satanic um, uh, cult and they're, they're trying to kill the kid to use him for a blood ritual. And, um, is Bella Thorne and Robbie Amell, who is Stephen Amell's brother, and Robbie Amell doesn't wear a shirt the entire uh, the entire movie. Just he's just walking around for no reason, shirtless, which I love. And at the end, he, the boy kills everybody and ends up, you know, surviving. And so this in the sequel is two years later. He's in high school. He's really cute now. He's had a bit of a glow up, and um, he's sort of like the, the the nerdy kid at school, and everybody nobody believes him about what happened, and. So he gets invited to a lake house with his friends, which is never a good thing in a horror film. And he goes to the lake house and it turns out all his friends are in the same satanic uh, cult. And so they're trying, so they try and kill him again and he has to survive until sundown. And if he makes it sundown, they all evaporate. And so eventually uh, the, he, 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 they end up all killing each other again, and then they bring back all the dead people from before. So it's Robbie Amell without a shirt on again for the entire movie, and it's just um, it's really fantastic and it's fun. I was wondering <laughs> if Bella Thorne was going to be in this one. Bella Thorne is in it, and she is hysterical. She's she, she really has like a star quality to her. Well, um, she just broke the internet, right? Or only she did. the first day on um uh was it. TikTok? No. OnlyFans. OnlyFans. Yeah, she joined OnlyFans. And on the first day, she earned a million dollars. And in the first week, she got two million dollars. And yeah, so she um she's, she's got that's, that's not a good thing because of no. the partners on there. It's so well, problematic. What happened was she started lying about her pictures, saying they were gonna be nudes and they weren't. And so all the sex workers were furious with her for making money without having to show anything. So it was well, a controversy. And for driving the price up so much. Yeah, for, yeah, that's true. And yeah, driving but, all of the users and audience over to her as opposed to giving money to where you know, sex workers actually need it. And Chris Evans is giving it away for free. Oh, uh, yes. I, it, it, it's, it's, it's all a big complicated Gordian, Gordinian knot. I'm sure us as gay men could find a lot of people that would pay for more content from Chris Evans. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so uh, the babysitter, Killer Queen. I have no re reason why it's called Killer Queen because there's no queens in it. There's no. They just thought it was a fun name, I guess. And like I said, the cartoon, the, the violence is all very cartoony and fun, and people's limbs are getting chopped off and their heads are chopped off, and it's 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 just it's a very it's it's more fun than you can shake a stick at, and it's the perfect ho or Halloween uh, uh, diversion. Well, let me bring it down then. Uh, a number five. Number five. Social dilemma. Have you have you heard about this? The new. Um, I was going to say, oh, shit. It is a Netflix doc, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Orlowski, who directed Chasing Ice and then Chasing Coral, which is about melding of the ice caps and the leaching of the coral, he's now turned his gaze on social media, and it is. A slightly dark, somewhat terrifying look at social media as a drug that is destroying us all. Isn't that a little facile? Isn't that something that we've that has been said for about twenty years now? And like, I, I mean, where where can you really go after you say social media bad? I mean, it's it, it's worth repeating, James. It's worth repeating. Well, just say it for the next ninety minutes. I mean, there's some mm -hmm. great bites actually. One is, you know, oh well. There's this great moment where they talk about how um, 
that there's only two areas where um, people talk about users. One is illegal drug pushers, drug dealers, and the other is social media users. And, uh, and the idea being that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we, this is this monetizing human futures. It's t turning our attention into, I can just see that cynical look on your face. Too, well, what, 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 what is new about that? We, I mean, the, the idea that we've lost our attention span. I, 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 I just don't see any, like, you know, it's, it's been done, right? What is he, what is he bringing to the table here? I, well, it is true, but if I was watching it with Nolan and Billy and, I was so all I wanted to do was whip out my phone and check my Facebook or check my Instagram. Oh, yes. But because of the film, I just felt I couldn't, and I had to be a good parent and just sit there, sort of. Can, <laughs> can, you, can you watch anything? Can you watch any TV movie or any TV show without doing checking your Twitter mm -hmm. every five minutes? Oh. You need to. You need to see this film, James. It's so interesting. It, it goes so much further beyond just how it's uh, destroying our, our our attention span, but how it's like really destroying the social fabric of society. It, sh it discusses how um, artificial intelligence that is social media is so far beyond our own understanding or anyone's understanding who was responsible for creating it in the first place, how it's evolved at such an extraordinary rate, but we as humans have not evolved to, ca to catch up with it. So it's already smarter than we are. And the, the programmers who are in charge of it don't even, they're not even in control of it themselves because what the AI chooses to show them is what it chooses to show them selectively. So they don't even have access to all of our data that has been collected and harvested over the past 10 years. James, remember the 2008 financial collapse because all these mortgages, these products, these financial instruments, no one knew what their value was. They were just making them. It's a little like that. It's out of control. No one has any real idea. Um, there is one one sort of bone I want to pick with it. Which, where there's one point where someone says, you know, it wasn't like when the bicycle came along, people were outraged. Well, that's what I was just going to say. People were outraged when the bicycle came along because it gave women mobility. And for the first time, women were going from village to village and it was seen as incredibly subversive and incredibly dangerous spread of, uh, there was a documentary called Ideals on Wheels. Um, but, but I mean, you know, the, that was when for women first wore pants because the, they, that was, they, they were on the bicycle. And, you know, but you think that the, the invention of the radio, the invention of, of TV, the, you know, rock and roll, like there have been things that have been gonna take down society for you know, a hundred years now, and society always seems to survive. And so how, but how, but how do you think we're doing, James, as a society? <laughs> well, it's true that that we have been devolving at a, at a rapid rate, uh, at an accelerated rate over the last four years. But what about um, the last four months? I mean, here we are. We haven't even seen each other. We've been sucked into the matrix. We haven't even had a physical interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, I and I and I do believe that the AI thing is is going to be increasingly a problem, and that the five G is a problem, and that uh, you know, I mean, like I there there are a lot of things that uh, you know, and that we are living in a simulation, and the matrix is is going to eat us. I thought it was really interesting the way it talked about the idea that it sees this polarization and this radicalization as as a sort of consequence of social media. That people, mm -hmm. uh, I, I I can't really retrace the steps that the documentary makes, but I I remember watching it thinking, shit, yeah, this is pretty true. You know, this is pretty scary well, stuff. Yeah, the part that was so fascinating to me was that it just really lays out how we are all living in our own individualized realities, because yes. what is laid out to us on social media or on Google, what I see is not what you see, James or Blake or Fenton. So that is what is real to me. And if you have no reference beyond that, then of course it's going to cause conflict and you know dilemma and drama between us as human beings, because my, what is true for me is not true for you. There well, is no, when the truth is so muddy, it's so hard to have any foundation of reality. And just imagine what me, Madonna sees. <laughs> well, the, the bubbleization of, of the world is something that I, I argue with my um, niece all the time. And I talk about how, you know, in my day, back when I was younger, how we had, <laughs> you know, three channels and taught the top 40 and everybody had the same context and every, you could go into a room and talk to anybody about what you saw on television the night before, what's number one, blah, 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 blah. And now I, 
what my what, what she watches and what I watch and what she the list what she listens to. We can't talk to each other because there's just there there's three thousand channels and a hundred thousand bands and like everybody has their own reality and everybody gets their news and you just you you have, your point of view is shaped by the by the type of news that you get. Correct. Speaking of 3,000 billion channels, the first episode of Drag Race Holland is on WOW Presents Plus. That is a channel that you need. Um, Very good, Fenton. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Better at this job, right? WOW Presents Plus. That's only three ninety nine dollars less than the price of a latte. We'll be right back after the break. Blake, have you got a question? Yep, it's another Emmy question. Only four reality programs have won the Emmy for Outstanding Competition Program. Us, as RuPaul's Drag Race, and what are the other three? All right, we'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to the WOW Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders WOW Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to the WOW Report. I'm Fenton here with Jane St. James, Blake, and our very super duper special guest, Jeffrey Boyer Chapman. You have a movie out, Jeffrey. We're gonna get to that, right? We're gonna, that I think is our number one this week. I shouldn't reveal, but that's our number one. And we'll talk about that in a second. So exciting. I know, let's get the answer to- The trivia Back question. Mm. I, uh, it's another one about the Emmys. I asked only four reality programs so far have won the Emmy for Outstanding Competition Program. One is RuPaul's Drag Race. What are the other three? The Amazing Race, uh -huh. uh, Survivor, and The Voice. And Project, I would say Project Runway. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe you have a guess? About Top Model. I don't think Project Runway ever won. It's The, I, amazing, I, the amazing Race, The yeah. Voice, RuPaul's Drag Race, and Top Chef. Oh. Top Chef. I would have thought Survivor would have been in there. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. Moving on. Number four. Number four. I want to talk about news of the weird, James. And I wanted to start out with yours. You just posted this today. And I didn't know about it. Hundreds of thousands of birds falling from the sky. In a what map style. On? What is happening? Well, now, come on. This has been happening for you. This has been happening for years. Birds just fall out of the sky and fish too. But not not in the numbers that we're seeing right now in the southwest of um, America, due to the forest fires, is one of the is the is one of the reasons because birds are migrate having to change their migration path and they can't go down the, the the coast anymore, which is where most of their food was. So they're having to go through New Mexico and Arizona and they're they're burning up and they are not able to eat and they're falling from the sky at a rate of 100,000 in the last um, couple of weeks, um, which is uh, it's the second largest, I think in the 1920s or something, there was something like 5.6 million that fell out of the sky one year. But this is on, on track to be one of the big greatest um, disasters for you know the birds. What was the cause in the, in the 1920s for that 5.6 million bird death? I think there was like a client, there was a, like a, a, a climate like a, a cold snap or something is they were i i can't remember i'll well we'll have to go back and reread the story but um Jeez. but some of the quotes in the article are really crazy aren't they read read a couple of them about how like it's just i collected over a dozen in just a two mile stretch in front of my house said martha desmond um she said to see this and to be picking up these carcasses and realizing how widespread this is is personally devastating to see this many individuals and species dying is a natural tra a national tragedy. She also said they're literally just feathers and bones. Oh. Yeah, and the, um, if that isn't crazy enough for you, Finn, how about a brain washing up on a beach? What? Yes. Yeah. Um, it was in it was at Lake Michigan Tuesday morning in Wisconsin. A beachcomber out for his daily stroll came across a square package of aluminum foil and held together by a pink rubber band. Jimmy Senda says curiosity got the best of him, so he opened the package to discover the gruesome content. It was a human brain? Yeah, well, it says Jimmy called the police to investigate and the Racine County <laughs> Medical Examiner tells TMZ the brain is not human. 
Oh, okay. Their early take is it appears to be from a cat, but it's huge. Like you should see a picture of it. Well, no, thank you. <laughs> I mean, in regardless, how did it end up wrapped up in aluminum foil and held together by a rubber band in Lake Michigan? Would you remember a few years ago when all the feet were were washing up in um uh was it Rockaway or something in New York mm -hmm. and it was something like um like dozens and dozens of human feet were washing up on shore and they couldn't figure out what it was um Did except they ever figure it out I It was the mafia wasn't it with the, the, there was a theory that it was a mafia or a serial killer but then they also realized that when bodies were disintegrating that if you had shoes on, that that kept the foot intact while the rest of the body sort of broke off and was fed by fishes. And so that's why the, sh the feet were washing ashore. Well, that's this week's news of the weird, Fenton. <laughs> I don't know if I could take any more. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you ever, I mean, it, it could just have been someone's meal. I mean, have you, you have ever, ever eaten brains before? No. I've eaten brains before. Cow brains? I think I've had cow brains. Yeah. I mean, I have heard like squirrel brains are like a thing. And monkey brains. I've 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 known lots of people who used to eat monkey brains <laughs> back in the day. I, that was a big cause of like diseases spreading. Like, I think uh, that's how Mad Cow started, wasn't it? Oh so, yes, right. Eating Ebola. I think they would like slice the top. Oh, it's just that. Can we just move on, please? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to bring it back up again. Number three. Number three. Um, I wanted to promote uh, um, a book that I've been reading. Fear is just a four-letter word. Um, How to Develop the Unstoppable Confidence to Own Any Room by Tracy Tudor, who is a beloved WoW celebrity and star of uh, Million Dollar Listing Los Angeles. Uh, we've, we've had her on the show here. Um, a couple times, and she's just she's just wonderful. I love her so much. Um, we should have her back on again. Um, she is a smart as a whip. She is kick ass. She is funny. She is stylish. She's chic as shit. I mean, she's just. I mean, she just when she she does when she walks into a room, she owns it. And the book is is sort of a, a guide to life. It um. A lot of the it's about dealing with overbearing and obnoxious personalities, both at work and in real life, how to dominate them and put them under your thumb. It's about how not to be freaked out or stressed out in high stress situations. Um, it's about the five things you should find out about a person before you meet with them for a meeting, um, how to negotiate for the things that you want at work uh, and um identifying Ooh. difficult people, the, the different personality traits so that you can um, work around them and work or to deal with them. And that's sort of where I am right now. What was the biggest takeaway for you so far? Pencil skirts and a, and a simple white blouse always work. <laughs> so, hey, I just, um, it's on sale right now. And um, I think, like I said, we need to get her on the show because she is <laughs> There, she has a lot to offer, and some of it is very funny because um, some of her problems are, uh, you know, do I take the ten million dollar uh, commission if if the person is crazy? Like, you know, like not many people can afford to turn down a ten million dollar commission. Like, crazy well, man. <laughs> this is more of like a self help book, like get through stress and help yourself with work, than it yeah. is like a steamy tell all about. No, 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 no. But she does, you know, she talks a lot about a different clients that she's had over the years and how she's managed to, you know, get to the top of, of the the real estate ladder and um, how she's managed to sort of dominate the show as she does. Wow. So she, she does tell a lot of insider scoop. I love a fierce bitch and I think she is one. She is a fierce bitch, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll wait to read it. Okay, we're going to move on to number two. Number two. Uh, this is, James, I suppose I mentioned this has been New York Fashion Week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, state. Well, it opened, New York Fashion Week opened with uh, exclusive screening of The House of Pierre Cardin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, documentary. I thought Pierre Cardin was dead. No, but no, he's still, and does he still live in that fabulous house on the Riviera? Yes. You know, he's 98. <laughs> 
He's still working, and he lives in that house on the Riviera that's like basically just all bubbles. Yeah, so, it's, just, it's a bubbles. series of spheres bubbles. that are all connected together. Yes. Is that movie? Is it? Is it not featured in uh, the Absolutely Fabulous movie? I think is it that is. The same house? Yeah. yeah. Yes, they they do a lot of fashion shows there still to this mm -hmm, day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I also didn't realize he was. Uh, he is. I mean, is Italian. He's yeah. not French. He's Italian, but and he democratized couture. Like yeah. they threw him out of the couture society or whatever it is because he did a ready to wear line for Printemps, the French uh, chain store. He discovered Gautier, Jean Paul Gautier. Oh, okay, sure. Dark. Oh my God. And you remember the cologne bottle? We should post a picture on the wear report. It's basically a penis, speaking of, you know, um, very satisfying to look at. Um, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Well, and what yeah. was one of the, it wasn't like Rudy Gernrich, one of his uh, disciples as well, and Peggy, Mo and he used Peggy Moffat and all those 60s people that are so iconic. Yes. And, and very important putting diverse models on the runway and not, yes. not sticking with white faces. He hired Asian models, African American models, Naomi Campbell's in it. Of Naomi. Course. Mm -hmm. Um, he, uh, I love the thing that he just did everything. He put his name on everything. He put it on plumbing. He put it on eyewear. He put it on toasters, cars. That that idea of just branding the 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 fuck but out. Isn't that, isn't that also sort of like what happened with Halston, and it was also part of his downfall as well? Yes, where he, yes but pick it, on, pick it on retain control of his business, and he never sold out to the luxury LVMH conglomerates. He still owns his business today. He also opened a theater because he said he, he wanted, from age eight, he wanted to be an actor and he never got to be. So he opened his own theater, the Espas Carter, and he had Alice Cooper perform there <laughs> during the school's out period. And, <laughs> and then he opened a festival in Marquis de Sade's castle in the South. I mean, <laughs> it was incredible. And, you know, men normally just conk out before women, but he is fabulous. Oh, this is great. He stunningly good looking as a young as a young man, and he says as much. He says in the documentary, "I was very beautiful. I came to Paris. Everyone wanted to sleep with me." And <laughs> so he put himself as a model in his own campaigns and wore his own clothes. And he was very avant garde, you know, like reinvented the dinner jacket, did a, a sort of black tie, which was without without a shirt or a collar. I can't remember oh, the Nehru collar, is, I think, was his thing, right? Yeah. They went to Maxim's and they wouldn't let him in because he was wearing one of his own creations. You know what he did? He bought Maxim's. Maxim's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the best. It was really that's good. Funny. I can't recommend it enough. It's by, um, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Uh, David Ebersole and Todd Hughes, who did the, the lovely documentary about Cher's mom. Oh, mm. okay, okay. Mm -hmm. well, so what, well, also, I'll check that out. Who is also 98 and she looks like a day over 58. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, because um, when you think of uh, in the 70s, Halston, Ralph Lauren, and Calvin Klein all started putting themselves in their own ads. And then Donatella, you know, does famously does. So he probably was the, one, the, the first to do that. That's fascinating. Isn't it just? Let's take a break. Tonight is the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race Vegas Review. Tune in, 8 p.m. VH1. And when we come back, the number one thing that made us go wow this week. You're listening to Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to the Wow Report. We've been counting down the top 10 things that make us go wow. wow. <laughs> we reached number one. Number one. And Jeffrey, you are number one. Again, you are number 10 and number one. You're the alpha, you're the omega, you're the A. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, you take it. But so uh, you got a movie, Spiral. Yes, very. Yes, I know, I've, seen, I've seen the um the the trailer for it. It looks absolutely spectacular. It's very spooky. Tell us, tell us, give us the plot line. Give us the give us the pitch. Yeah. Oh my goodness! So it's a psychological thriller about a family who's a same sex couple who moves to a small town to raise their sixteen year old daughter, and things are not quite as they seem. It's set uh -oh. in the 1990s in middle America. And I think that it's just, it fits perfectly in with the theme of this episode because there has, there's some, some dark sinister cult elements to it, but 
really um, it's an exploration of uh, my character who's named Malik. It's his. It's an exploration of his uh, his his him dealing with trauma, something that something really horrific that happened to him in his youth and how it's continued to play out and affect him in his adult life. And he is the sole person of color in this film, surrounded by white folk in white spaces, and it's you know with his white partner. It's a it's a story or a you know, just kind of shines a light on how we as, as people of color, specifically black folk, are cons constantly facing being gaslit and, um, you know, being, having to deal with microaggressions, even from the people who we love the most. So it's it's a really heartbreaking tale of um, oppression, but it's it was just such, it was such a phenomenal project to make. I shot it like two years ago. It's like my third horror project, which is so bizarre to me because I am <laughs> such, a, I am so sensitive and I cannot watch horror movies to save you are my life honey. you are the new the, the latest you're the new jamie lee curtis i'll <laughs> take it yes <laughs> <laughs> um well, tell me the, so it's sort of like a gay get out right correct yeah yeah okay, okay. It's been, it's and been compared. the reason why it's set in the 90s what what was different about the 90s as far as the microaggressions and, and the the prejudice and things like that is was that the reason it's set in the 90s because things have changed or what well not much has changed and i think that really plays into the title of the film that it's just a spiral that it's just it, there's there's always something that society is afraid of there's always some group of people that we will vilify and kind of pile on to whether it's queer people or black folk or Muslim folk or whatever it may be. That element of otherness is something that is so deeply misunderstood in our society. And generally what we are afraid of uh, is what we miss most misunderstand, you know? So it, was, it comes out. What was the, the fact that you had a 16 year old daughter, is that something that was very different in the nineties? Was that the reason, I mean, is that something that is, plays into it? It definitely plays into the story. And I think it's just, you know, it shows uh, how how deeply fucked up the, you know, uh, the society's view was, especially, I mean, it is today, but especially in the 90s of a gay couple raising a right. child and the challenges that come along with that. So, yeah. It, it premiered last night on Shudder. <laughs> it premiered last night on Shudder. And I think it'll be playing in some, in some uh, drive-in theaters around Los Angeles as well. But it's a really, really phenomenal film. I'm so, so proud of it. And I really hope that it resonates with folk and that people really enjoy it as much as I loved making it. And who are, who are the other yeah, actors in it? Uh, Lachlan Monroe is in it with me. He's from Riverdale. If you saw his face, you would know him from a bajillion different projects. But, you know, the fun thing about this is that it was an independent thriller. So, so many of the cast are kind of, you know, relatively unknowns. There's some familiar faces that you will see that have popped up in different thrillers and, you know, different genre films uh, over the past couple of decades. But it's a really fresh face cast and it's really, it's fascinating. Fenton has seen it. He got a sneak peek of it last year. I have seen it and I loved it. I was like, I mean, I think you're such a great actor anyway, Jeffrey. But Thank I thought you. it was such a moving, compelling. I mean, it was like a spiral. And you sort of um It sounds sort of Hitchcockian, like uh it's, it's and it's it's sort of it's not it's not dour, it's just creepy. And mm -hmm. then that sort of it's that note that I think we're seeing again and again in the culture now that feels so on point and so mm -hmm. just chillingly resonant with, with, with what with what's going on with Black Lives Matter and and the whole social media because there is this sort of and 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 the, the, this idea that you know we're all in our bubbles and in this sort of satanic cold and it, it's just mm -hmm. it's very very timely I think yeah um, yeah it absolutely is and very well, I hope it well I hope everybody enjoys it no, so wait, 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 hold on I'm see Lachlan Monroe I wanted which, which one is he Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Totally. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and you well, can... that's what we've got time for this week. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us again. Anytime. Uh, thank you so much for oh, having me. Yeah, you'll be back again and again and again. Absolutely. James, James, miss you. Lovely to see you. Thank um, you. And Blake. I you guys. I miss all of you. Yeah, me too. Same time, same place next week. Until then, go out, wear a mask, don't lick things. And do something that makes the world go wow. Wow. <laughs>